Good morning. We'll call this meeting to order. Good morning. Uh, clerk, we, uh, do we have a public comment? I believe you indicated we have two individuals who signed up. Uh, uh, Mr. Larry Pierce and uh, Professor Tomaski. Mr. Larry Pierce, if you could please come to the podium. And uh, your subject matter this morning is policy and standards. Uh, if you could just uh, restate your name, give us your address and your subject matter. Uh, again, just make sure the conversation this morning or the discussion is civil, and we respect uh, your right to address the citizens of Douglas County, but this uh, civility is important in my meetings and also. So if you could, just if you could just proceed. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Good morning, everyone. Madam Chair, morning. Commissioners, fellow citizens here. Uh, I've got two or three things to touch on today. And I didn't know until 12 o'clock yesterday that the courthouse was open. It's funny, I sit with 15 or 20 people, and I think 19 of them said the courthouse is closed because it's a holiday. Finally, someone said, I work for the Parks Department. I got to go to work tomorrow. So I only found out <coughs> we were open today. Surprising how many people I think were closed. Today I wanted to touch on something. Uh, this book here, at one time, belonged to a friend of mine named Bill Posey. Y'all are old enough to remember Bill was an attorney here. He lost a daughter some years ago. And uh, in this book, there's something I want to bring up. But the first thing I want to bring up is, you know, I'm always complaining about other people, but I want to tell you what happened to me. And what happened to me on Tuesday is I entered the courthouse. And when I got up to security, three deputies came forward and said, Mr. Pierce, you can't come in. I said, huh? They said, you can't come in. I can't come in what? I can't come in the courthouse. I said, I can't? No, Miss Godwin's here. <coughs> I said, oh. Well, where is she? She's on the second floor. Well, I need to go to the fourth floor to talk to the court reporter about my transcript that I just paid $120 for a few, about four <coughs> months ago. She finally got it done. I said, well, you can't come in. I said, oh. So I went outside and I sat where the smoking people sit. Fortunately, there was nobody there and I sat there kind of contemplating, made a few phone calls to my board of directors. <laughs> and uh, I said, guess what? So about 50 minutes later, another deputy came out. And he said, Mr. Pierce, you can't be sitting here either. I said, huh? He said, you can't be anywhere in the back. You can't be anywhere in the parking lot. As a matter of fact, you need to be probably across the street from the sidewalk. Well, you know, all I could do is make a report to the Sheriff's Department about what took place, and I did. For some of you who don't know what it is, it's called evidentiary. You should always list, and I was in court for eight years on property, and that's one thing I learned, evidentiary. You write it down. Okay. So, what I'd like to say for, oh, did I leave? Oh, yeah, I got in my van and I left. Now, there's something here that I came across, and maybe Mr. Bernard can explain it a little better later sometime or another. Mr. Pierce, your three minutes have exceeded. We've exceeded your three minutes. The I have already? Yes. Well, I'll tell you, time just flies. Yes, sir. Okay. There goes my policy statement. There goes my other statement. There goes about stalking. And uh, welcome back, John Tomoski. We wondered where you were. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, um, Ms. Pierce, for taking your matters under advisement. Uh, Professor Tomaski, if you could come forward. forward there you are. <coughs> please restate your name and give us your address for the record, please. Uh, John Tomaski, uh, I'll be quite brief, and uh, it uh, has to do with uh, proclamations 4, 6, and 7. 
Um, and uh, on a previous occasion, there was a similar instance, but uh, I <coughs> didn't feel it was necessary at that time to point anything out, but I see the same thing again. And uh, I would defer to the esteemed county attorney, um, uh, actually a former member of the Board of Regents, um, on this, but it would seem to me that uh, you can acknowledge, even uh, as a body, endorse a national proclamation, but I don't think the county has authority to uh, proclaim anything nationally. So uh, for uh, the future, you may want to uh, investigate that. Uh, I am stating this as a supposition, but it seems a reasonable one to me. And uh, just from point of view of the good governance protocol and possibly uh, avoiding embarrassment, uh, you might want to uh, consult the esteemed attorney on the matter or other <coughs> credible sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Damaski. We'll take this matter under advisement. <coughs> All right. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, Board of Commissioners, tomorrow you have your approval of the minutes. Please uh, take a look at those minutes and then you will approve accordingly tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, proclamations. We have four proclamations tomorrow. <coughs> number, tab number four is proclaiming the month of October's National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And that would be um, Russ Martin will be presenting or uh, reading the proclamation, shall I say. And then tab number five, proclaiming the month of October's Breast <coughs> Cancer Awareness Month in Douglas County, with, uh, which again, the boss uh, will be reading that as well. And proclaiming the month of um, October's National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Douglas County. We will have a meeting also tomorrow, and then also proclaiming the month of October's National Hispanic Heritage, Heritage Month in Douglas County. So now we'll move on to our first business item, and I skipped our presentations, and I didn't do that on purpose, so I'm going to go back up to presentations. And presentations we have. Our first one is presentation. Presentation of the first 90-day report for the Connect Douglas Fixed Route and Paratransit Service. And that is our own Mr. Gary Watson, Director of Connect Douglas. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Gary. As, as everyone knows, we launched our fixed route bus service on June the 20th. Uh, the period from June the 20th to now has been uh, busy, exciting, challenging, and we feel uh, progressive and successful. And this morning, I want to share with you some of the data that we collected during uh, this period. ridership. The first thing I want to show you is uh, the certifications that we've had for our discount program. We've had 223 <coughs> senior adults sign up for our discount fare, 30 paratransit individuals, 28 disability individuals, and 33 students. Now there's a difference in paratransit and disability. Paratransit is for individuals who have such a disability that it prevents them from using our regular fixed route service. That's a door-to-door -door type service. Uh, disability is individuals who um, have a, a disability, but it doesn't necessarily prevent them from riding the, the fixed route service, but they are <coughs> eligible for a discount. So that's the difference in paratransit and, and disability. Okay, overall boardings. Uh, from June the 20th uh, through the end of September, we had 87 days in service. Our standard fixed route boardings numbered 5,452, 576 flex trips, 404 paratransit boardings. That gives us a total a number of boardings of 6,432. 
which uh, computes out to an average boy per day of 74. Now that's from June the 20th through the end of September. However, uh, look at October. Um, from the 1st of October through the end of last week, we had 945 boardings, and that averages out to 105 boardings uh, per day. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but I, the number of boardings that we have have increased every month that we've been in operation. In June, we had 597 boardings uh, through a limited number of days. In July, we had 1,195 boardings, August 1,755 boardings, and then in September 1,905 boardings. So a good, slow, progressive, steady rise in ridership. Uh, the number of boardings by route. Uh, route 40 and Route 20 are our strongest routes. Uh, route 40, we're averaging 23 boardings a day. Route 20, uh, we're averaging uh, 20 boardings per day. Boardings by day of the week. Wednesday and Friday are our strongest days. Uh, Saturday, as you might expect, has been our, our weakest day. This is interesting to me. Our most frequently used pickup points. Thornton Road Walmart is by far the strongest. Arbor Place Mall is next. Uh, the Douglas Boulevard Park and Ride comes in third, followed by the Transportation Center, the Douglas Old Walmart, and then the Epicenter, uh, where we have the transfer with the Cobb system. Uh, our fixed route in ADA fare collection. You can see the numbers there. The total that we collected is about $11,000 uh, through the, the four months. Uh, our average one-way fare for July through September is $1.83. Our total operating expense. Uh, we've made $549,000 in payments for our third-party operator. You can see the other expenses we've had, maintenance, repairs, uh, body work to the buses <coughs> following a couple of accidents, uh, washing and detailing the buses. We believe it's very important to keep our buses clean for our passengers. You owe $56,000. Total expenses of $618,979. Revenue. Uh, we received 439,511 in reimbursements from the Federal Transit Administration. Fair box collection, $10,369. Total revenue, $449,880. Uh, operating costs and our revenue. Uh, our estimated monthly operating costs over a 12 month period is $166,000 per month. Uh, thus far, our actual monthly operating costs have been $157,000. So we're operating about $8,900 under budget to this point per month. And the uh, total uh, monetary comp, uh, amount that Douglas County has put in so far is about $169,000. Okay, so <coughs> what, are, what are we doing right so far? Ridership has increased each month. Good, slow, steady uh, increase. Uh, we're developing regulars who use our system to, to go to work, go to the doctor, go shopping, and just to simply get out of the house. Uh, the transfer system from Cobb County is working really well. We're averaging about tra five transfers a day in that system. We're operating under budget, and despite some of the glitches that we've had, people who use the system like it a lot. Okay, what have been our glitches? Well. Our on-time performance needs to improve. Uh, it's gotten better as we've gone along, but we've still got areas that we need to improve in. Uh, we've had some issues with uh, the drivers not picking up riders who are waiting at the stops. Um, we've been working with our third-party provider to give us uh, better data uh, for the reports that we have to compile. Uh, weak ridership on Route 30 is something that we've got to deal with. And then something that's sort of out of our control is traffic. As y'all know, on Chapel Hill Road, Highway 5, uh, Douglas Boulevard, traffic can be terrible at times. So where do we go from here? Well, we've got some things that we're looking at. 
uh, we're considering uh, extending some of our existing routes. Uh, we probably need to go farther down Highway 5. Same thing with Chapel Hill Road. And one area that we're getting a lot of uh, requests for additional service from is the area from um, Fairburn Road all the way down to Lee Road. We need to see about getting Route 40 off of I-20. Uh, we've had too many occasions where our buses have got caught in accident traffic on I-20 and it's really fouled up the schedule. So we, uh, we've got to work on that. Uh, we're, we're considering combining routes 30 and 40, particularly on the, the weekend. Uh, also, we're thinking about extending some of our hours. And again, this is in particular to Route 30 because some of the warehouses and distribution centers have told us that our schedule doesn't coincide with their shift schedules. So that's something that we're going to be looking at as well. Uh, we're looking at uh, some kind of special service hours during the holidays uh, to make shopping um, easier for some of the people who are using our, our buses on a regular basis. And one thing that we're wanting to look at is reducing headway. The headway is the time between buses. For instance, uh, if a, a, a bus arrives at the mall at 9 o'clock and then the next bus arrives at 9.45, that's 45 minutes headway. But right now, we're averaging, our headway is averaging 45 minutes to an hour. We want to reduce that. We'd like to, to get that down to 30 minutes if, if all possible. So that's the look at what we've done uh, this far. Thus far, uh, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that anybody might have. Okay. Oh, Vice Chairman, I hope you get a question from you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll be brief. I've got a long agenda today. Um, uh, thank you, Gary. Um, obviously, this is information that we've been waiting that first 90-day report. Um, it, in my opinion, it, it looks solid, a good first step. I mean, obviously, we've got a three-year walk here. Um, a couple questions, though. Um, as it relates to, and you talked about it as far as um, and I'm going to just put this out here. I know the answer, but I, I know you answered. When will the administration make modifications, your structural change to routes? What, what, what has been decided when those changes were made? How often that's, per year? That's been a, a big topic of conversation internally with us. Uh, we don't want to make any changes until right after the first of the year. Pe people are still getting used to using the system, and we want to give them a little more time to get used to the system, become familiar with the system. And then we have some people who still don't know about it. So, so we want a little more time to work through all those issues before we start making radical changes. Understood. Uh, but, but it seems like this is a good baseline. Looks like you, there's some immediate things out the gate we know we need to smooth it out, right? So yes. we're recognizing there's a learning curve here. Some things like, okay, get off the highway. Like, why are we on the highway? If, if that's facetious, you give a point. Uh, but secondly, is, and I think this is something that even Madam Chair has mentioned in our committee meeting, is education, right? One of, um, just this past weekend, I was in a meeting Saturday morning at some pancake fundraiser. And, and one of the comments that came forth when I was talking about this was the need for our, our schedules are not as intuitive as we believe we, we think they are. What, what are we doing to try to educate people on, um, everybody didn't grow up um, in Washington, D.C. or Cleveland, Ohio or some of the more advanced um, systems or even um, um, using MARTA across the river. What are we doing to educate people on um, our schedule? Well, one of the big things that we're doing right now is we're developing a, a three-minute uh, video on how to read the schedule and how to ride the bus service. Uh, Rick Martin's staff is graciously working with us on that. We should have that complete hopefully in the next two to two to three weeks uh, so we're, we're doing that we're, we're also uh, implementing a series of uh, articles that we will be distributed to the, the local media about how to ride the bus and in particular how to read the schedule um, we're going to have more of a concentration on getting out to the public uh, going to civic cl uh, clubs uh, community organizations uh, having training sessions with them on how to ride the bus and also how to read the schedule. Um, uh, we're, we're still continuing our, our multifaceted uh, educational uh, marketing campaign. We're, we're looking at doing something uh, in the mall uh, through the holidays. So a lot of different facets 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. I'm almost finished. A couple more questions. So, all right. I, I get that. Um, we talked about the structural changes, which is the routes, which was the baseline. Let's talk about the existing routes and the adequacy of our bus stops. Um, two things about bus stops feedback I've received is, uh, though they were very, very cute and creative, um, as far as our signs are concerned, they, they, we, we, it sounds like they want the old school, ugly government, white signs, directional. Can we get something that, because it, it's blending in too much. And so I, I think that's a constructive yeah. criticism that, that I, I received well and that duly noted. Um, I think we erred on the side of just, we wanted to you know, make it, it, but it needs to be functional. What are we doing about bus stops, signs and bus stops? Go ahead. Uh, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, I've directed my staff to, to look at redesigning the signs. Uh, we'll come up with a design, uh, let the commissioner take a look at it, and, and then we'll have them uh, uh, printed and, and put out at all of our various stops throughout the county. And, and then finally, the bus stops, and that'll be my last question. I'll yield to my colleagues, which is bus stops, where we're talking about um, benches and shelters. I know there was a presentation done earlier this year. <laughs> My question is, is that where are we at in that? I know we're trying to still stabilize routes, but it's gonna get cold. It's gonna get wet. And so we've got citizens that'll be waiting, no more than children, but what, what are we doing regarding um, shelters, benches, et cetera? Well, we already have a grant in place that provides some money for some shelters <coughs> uh, and benches. Uh, we'll, we'll take the information that we've gathered as part of this report and start looking at where we're going to put those <coughs> shelters. Um, and my guess would be that, again, that would be right after the first of the year before we start installing the shelters. We want to yield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, any other questions for the board? Commissioner Geiger. Yes, uh, Gary, the Highway 5, uh, the extending the route, uh, where are you talking about? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't know for sure yet. I would say probably at least down to, to Kings Highway. Uh, somewhere down down into that area well there's uh, s several apartments that i don't think are being serviced right now the one right behind um red lobster we actually serve that one. Oh, you do yes, i've never seen one go in yeah there. we and the we, one behind kroger you do service yeah. that mm -hmm. okay i haven't seen yeah. them over that way yeah for the the one behind red lobster we actually pull up behind red lobster uh, let's stop there. That apartment complex would, would not let us actually go into the complex itself, so we had to stop there behind the Red Lobster, but we do serve that area. Okay, and is there any plan to like go out to Villa Rica because there is a, a huge senior complex out there? <coughs> uh, not at this time. Um, we we We've got two options moving forward that we can look at for that area out there. We can look at it putting a fixed route uh, service out there, or uh, when we start looking at demand response, we can serve that area uh, with that. So that's the decision we'll make moving forward. On the demand response, that's like dialogue, yes, which is what uh, I was advocating for to begin right. with. But when do you, do you have an estimated date for that? We'll start working on that again in, in 2020. Uh, we've been told that by various operators that it won't take long to get demand response up and running. So you know, I, would, I would say by the, the last quarter of 2020, first quarter of 2021, we should be able to have something up and running. So is there a special software out there available so you can- A scheduling software. Schedule them? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> That's all. Right. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Carson? Yes. So, Gary, I, I noticed the numbers that were in front seem astronomical, but you really can't put a number on people's quality of life and being able to really access um, transportation to get to work and to get to shopping and the other things that you stated. Um, however, you said that we are on track. How, how much are we, or under budget, how much are we under budget? And do you see that forecast continuing? Well, right now we're operating at about $8,900 per month mm -hmm. under budget. Now that, that total could change as we move forward, it, especially if, if we put on additional buses to cut down the headway 
uh, if we extend our routes, if we extend our service area, that's obviously going to cause our cost to go up. So I, I don't have any definite numbers on that, but but our our goal, our, our absolute requirement is to stay under that $2 million a year budget that we set for the mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. And of course, Chapel Hill Road, yeah, this, this weekend, Chapel Hill Road, oh my gosh, it was, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. So many people are in their cars, and I know a lot of them, because I was one of them coming out my subdivision, yeah. going to the mall. Mostly all of us were doing that. Yeah, and, so. and, that, and that traffic <laughs> is one of the things that's causing us to have on time issues. <coughs> the, the buses get stuck in the traffic just like we do in our individual cars. <coughs> mm -hmm. Got you. All right. Well, thank you, and good job. Thank good you. job. Okay, well, thank you, Commissioner Carlton. Commissioner Mitchell, I believe I saw you. Yes. <coughs> so, you talked about marketing. Mm -hmm. Trying to get, for those who don't know, and trying to get those guys fully aware of this particular service that we offer. Right. Give me again kind of what that plan is and kind of how you're going to navigate that so we can kind of, you know, make sure those that don't know know. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, we're, we're trying to each every nook and cranny in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is uh, that we're re getting ready to, to flood cable TV mm -hmm. uh, with a 30-second spot on our service that will that'll run the rest of this year and, and probably into early 2000. In tween. Uh, I mentioned the newspaper series of newspaper articles that we're getting ready to do, uh, the three minute video on, on how to ride the service and, and read the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're in talk with the mall about doing something out there, especially during the holidays. We feel like that would give us great, great exposure. Mm -hmm. And again, we want to continue going out, out to the people, uh, being at community events. Uh, it's my goal to, to have a, one of our representatives go to every civic club that we have in the county and talk to them about it. Uh, we continue to work closely with the senior citizens um, about riding there. But uh, we've, we've had good response from our seniors. Uh, they, they really like what we're able to provide. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll also add, you probably want to add what Rick and these other guys add to the social media side of that with that commercial or whatever that right. is that you do. Yes. You talk about how great it is and how, you know, when I wrote, you know, connect up this blah, 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 my experience, just that kind of stuff. So right. I think that'll kind of get a, a whole secular of folks engaged mm -hmm. if they want to ride them. To the signage, you, um, the signage has been, as Vice Chairman Robinson stated, has been uh, a unique situation with those that I know that rides the improvement you're working on because I think that's most are saying first of all I, I don't know that that's the signage and that's where I'm supposed to stand and that's what I you know kind of connect with the uh, connect up is so how long would it be before you actually get this new signage in place and before us so we'll see that versus we're working on it I mean this is well, the, the signage is going to be yeah. an issue in the very beginning that won't take long we okay. should have the new sign designed by the end of the year, by the end of this month Okay. And then uh, we'll let the commissioners take a look at it. And once we get that approval, we'll go ahead and, and, and get them printed. Are these the signs going to be signs that you'll stick in the ground, as I've seen some? Are we going to mount to the pole? How are we going to? Well, we'll just, the ones that we've got now, we'll replace those. <coughs> they're, just, they're all poles. Okay, got it. So it'll hopefully be larger. The they'll, be, they'll be about the same size, but they'll just be more visible. Yeah, easier to see. So they'll be about the same size. So <coughs> if that's not an issue, the size will be, or is it that our ordinance will allow you to put something bigger? Not that I need to be a, a four by four. <laughs> that would be ideal. <laughs> well, the, the size that we're using is pretty much the industry standard right. size. We, we just need to uh, make the, the graphics and the, the lettering more visible. And also one thing we're going to do is on the on the sign at each stop is, is have the number of the, the routes that serve that particular stop. So now you're adding a lot of verbiage there, and you're telling me that the size is going to work. I just think you're going to probably find yourself again with a sign that you really can't read unless you're up on it versus if I'm driving by trying to see, oh, that's a stop. I think you're going to probably run into the same situation now that you're trying to add a lot of information on it, unless it's going to be a two-fold sign. I mean, I don't know with something hanging below with routes and everything. I don't know. It just, I just think I'll still run into that same issue with, okay, I see a sign, but I can barely read it now. 
Okay. Well, we'll we'll present something to the board, and, and y'all can either say let's go with it or do something else. Okay. Okay. I mean, fine. Okay. Um, you mentioned the uh, the headway, reducing the headway. Mm -hmm. Explain me what the headway is again. I think it's about timing of forty five minutes to an hour. But and then I got a question. Yeah. Headway time. headway is the time between <laughs> bus arrivals. Right. Like if, if a bus arrives at the mall at 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. the next bus arrives at 9.45, right. your headway is 45 minutes. I understand. Uh, we're, our headway right now is 45 minutes to an hour. Right. Uh, we want to get that down to 30 minutes. Got it. So that means we'll increase uh, that with another bus. Add, add more buses to okay. Okay. Yes, sir. That means you'll increase an expense. Correct. And so now our savings will now be starting to replenish, but you're trying to keep it under the $2 million yes. a year, so you're, you're kind of keeping that exactly. in mind. Right. So we won't kind of go over budget. Exactly. How much do you think you've got to play with that will give you, and I don't know if you know the numbers now, though, but do you know kind of what that number roughly looks like? I know this is a rough savings, which I appreciate. This is, this is some good information we've all been waiting for. Can you gauge down the road what that looks like? Not at this particular time. We'll we'll have to get with our third party provider and, mm -hmm. and have talk to them about how many additional drivers they would have to add mm -hmm. and some cost factors like that before we can really come up with a a good estimate. Good okay. Um, okay, but you, you haven't gotten you don't know that number yet, which I, I, I can probably see why you, you don't have that. Have we also thought about in in altering and changing and adding to these routes going into large subdivisions? I can speak of one like Hunters Ridge. Um, uh, and a few other large subdivisions, because if I had to walk out of that subdivision and come to a place of a bus, bus reference, then I'm probably not going to do that. Yeah. Versus, I, I, I mean, I, I noticed my colleague talked about apartment complexes, but I think there's a couple of nice sized subdivisions that we might want to kind of take a, you know, a look at versus just apartment complexes, not to leave them off. But I think, we, you know, hopefully you guys kind of keep that in mind as well, because Hunters Ridge, you know about because you know that's a hypothetical. If I walked out of Hunters Ridge in the very back, it'll take me a day to get to uh, Malone. Mm -hmm. Would I ride a bus at that point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if we want to start trying to at least think about along those lines of, of situations like that. Now, if there's not a need and find that the need is not there, then you're right. Because I've always spoke about leadership and determining kind of the direction of this whole makeup. Have we? Are we looking at those things? Are we considering that? I mean, well, we obviously we, we look at all options. Now, okay. typically, fixed route won't go into a subdivision. But they they would make a stop at the the entrance to the subdivision. And now, in, in cases that you're talking about, if someone lives down in that in that subdivision, they can take advantage of the flex service that we have, which which means that they would call ahead and make a reservation and the, the bus would veer okay. off its, its normal route and go back and, and pick them up. Got it. Uh, but now those those type of trips are limited. We have to limit them in order to keep the routes on, on schedule. Okay. But that is an option for individuals. Yeah, I, I'm just, you know, throwing it out there because I just know using that as a hypothetical there, no one will walk from the back of that subdivision all the way to the front just to get to one of the routes, which the route is actually down at, correct me if I'm wrong, it's down at uh, 92. Mm -hmm. So not only you got to walk a mile or two to get out of the subdivision, but then you got to walk an additional mile down to 92. So have we thought about even adding some stops, you know, that may be, that, that, that's probably why the ridership is where it is. Sure. Yeah. And again, we're considering things like that all the time. And, and uh, an example I'll give you is that, uh, the city's municipal building mm -hmm. down on Fairburn mm -hmm. Road. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of calls and requests to make that a stop. Mm -hmm. So when we do extend one of our routes, say from the I-20 bridge at Fairburn Road, mm -hmm. going on down Fairburn Road to Lee Road, uh, we'll make that a stop. Mm -hmm. So all things like that are under consideration. Good, good, good. I just don't want to miss out because I think this, this program is going to be really crucial when it comes down to the ridership and, and getting to those that really need it and want to use it the most versus just making a stop. Sure. Because just making a stop, as I just use Hunter's Ridge, there's no way 
you no longer leave Hunters Ridge, go down to 92 to ride a bus. But I don't know if the demand is there to you know to even go into Hunters Ridge right. or, or even stop somewhere on the level. You know, but just food for thought. Okay, I, I yield back. Good job. Right. This is some, some valuable information. Though. Thank you again. I yield back. Commissioner Commissioner Carpenter. Just two quick questions, sure. Gary. One, can we use the entire pole for the signage? So we have the little sign at the top, but below it, if we could use a sign that just says bus stop, B-U-S-S-T-O-P, sure. so that people know that that is actually where, because I can't see it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Po the pole's ours. We could certainly do So let's like use that. the whole pole, is my suggestion. So that way, when you come before us, we can actually say, yeah, and let's move this okay. forward so we don't, you know. Uh, and if, if I may, Commissioner. There are some requirements that would prohibit the use of the entire pole, but we would have to stay towards the upper two to three feet. Uh, but below that, somebody could actually walk into it, and so there's a safety concern. I tell you, yeah. A good portion of that can be used. Yeah, yeah, but let's let's see what we can do yeah. to at least make that sign bigger. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's, let's see what we can do there. We'll, we'll work on that and bring something back to you. Okay, and the second part is, is there a hotline or a, um, a tip line or, or something that the citizens can use to call in suggestion, a suggestion sure. line? So just what Commissioner Mitchell you know, alluded to, let's see how many people are actually needing areas. Uh, service. If, if there is a, a hotline and yes, we're doing the video, we can definitely put that information out there. Yeah, that, uh, people can call our main line 770-949-7665, hit uh, option 5. Uh, we take suggestions, comments, criticism, all of that. Um, uh, we also have a, a, an email address uh, that people can uh, uh, contact us with and, and we quite often get uh, questions and requests over our email. So so we have several options that are available. And we're aggregating all that information mm -hmm. to help us make better decisions. Yes, in, okay. the, in the full 70-something page 90-day report that I emailed to all of you the other day, the, the, the final part of that report is, is a, a list of all the comments that we had gotten over that 90-day period, good, bad, whatever. Great. Thank you so much. I am. Okay. Could you reach out uh, to Commissioner Goddard and ask first and then finish okay. Just another quick question. Uh, I know that we have a matching amount that we have to do each year, and part of that's going to come out of the fares. How do we, how are we faring there? Are we um, collecting what you anticipated collecting? Yes, ma'am. Pretty much, we we knew at least. Uh, well, it's in, never going to pay for itself. No, it's never going to pay that. for itself. And we, but you we, anticipated so many, so much right. money coming out of the fares. Are we going to reach that goal? <laughs> uh, not for a while. The again, the industry st standard. If you can collect twenty to twenty five percent of your operating cost in, in fare fare box collections, you're doing real well. We're we're certainly not there. Yeah, and, and, and how much do we have to match each year for the two million? Twenty percent. Twenty percent of it. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right, I get back. Mm -hmm. well, one last additional question. So, is there an app <coughs> for uh, Matt Douglas? So, if I got on my phone, and anybody else got on their phone and want to either comment, ask for something on demand, or I live on um, too below. Uh, well, right now. Mm -hmm. What the app that we have is called Passio Go, okay. and it's it's a real time app where you can click on it, and it, it will show you where the buses are and how far they are from the stop that you're at. Good, good. Okay, but so there is so that's my my so but we, we probably need to acknowledge that or you know make sure in our marketing mm -hmm. that because what a high percentage of the general public uses a phone and they probably had an idea that there was an app that that only showed them where the bus is, how far before they get to that stop, and how long it's going to take them to get <coughs> point A to point B. I think that would probably be useful for right. those. So we might want to make sure we acknowledge that there's an app, because now that I know that, which I didn't know, 
I'll definitely download that just to kind of get a, mm -hmm. a visual. Now, if it shows all the routes, or you just you can kind of go in the app and you can specifically pull out each route. Yeah, yeah. you can you can look at whichever route you're interested in. Right. Um, yeah. And are are you able to comment in as well? Are you no, sir. Right now, that app doesn't have any kind of comment uh, mechanism with it strictly to show you where the, the buses are. Is, is that something that's, that's in the future possible or to add that as a feature as part of the app? Uh, we'll, need, we'll need to talk to the, uh, the developer of it right now. I don't know if that's a possibility on that particular app. Can you pay on that? Can you, you know, you know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, money, money talks if you, you tell them you want something. They, no, 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 I'm just saying if I want to, you know, I'm going to take one of the routes, but I want to use my phone to kind of, okay, I know where the route is, and I'm, I'm going to pay my dollar or $2 or whatever that is, and I just kind of snap, I mean, get on the, on the bus, hit uh, whatever, you know, area that would accept my app fee. I mean, no, or uh, if it isn't, that's okay. I'm just, you know, that's most by taking that kind of a direction when it comes to, to apps and phones and all that kind of good stuff. Mo we want to be mobile, but the mobile usage is what most of us kind of live by. Yeah, and, and again, Commissioner, moving forward, we'll, we'll be looking at, at all of that. We're, we're just so young in our development. That's okay. Right now, there's, there's, there's a lot that we want to do that we just haven't got around to. So the answer to it is that it doesn't, which is okay. It doesn't, right. But yeah, that's right. In the, in the future, let's, let's kind of look at those kind of things. But I just want to make sure we give any and everybody as much marketing and or idea of how they can use the, the, the services to include the holiday service. I mean, I think, but we can't just throw out a holiday service for the holidays from Thanksgiving to, to, to Christmas and nobody know about it. And what the true purpose of it other than, well, we hadn't provided one, but nobody knew it. Right, totally right, yes sir. Okay, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Director Watson. And I know you're working also with the hotels. A, a few uh, the hotels requested you, yes, if you could, to help accommodate some of their, I guess, their clients. When they come through. So I know you're working on that. So. Have a meeting for that Wednesday. And uh, could you repeat the app? What was the name of the app again? Passio Go. P A S S I O G O. Passio Go. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, Great presentation. Lord, you this is real. This is good music to our ears. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. All right, we'll move on. Uh, board of Commissioners, I want you all to take a look at the, uh, your approval of your expenses for tomorrow as well. I'm kind of moving back and forth. I'm just trying to move this meeting along. So please be prepared to approve your expenses accordingly tomorrow. Um, next, we have another presentation. Our other presentation is review of the county's benefits program status and presentation of plan year 2020 employee benefit <coughs> offerings. And our own director, uh, Chair, Chair, uh, we'll, we'll be brief as we possibly can. Okay. We just, uh, <coughs> uh, Matt Bidwell from uh, MSI Benefits is going to come. He's going to uh, just give us a brief overview of the 2019 benefits renewal recap. Give us a recap of that. Uh, we're going to talk about the 2020 projected uh, benefit costs. Uh, give a, uh, an idea of what the 2020 open enrollment uh, timeline is going to look like and provide the board with a recommendation from the benefits committee so we can move forward okay. with, uh, with the program. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. I know one of the, whoop, see what I mean? One of these buttons will do it. Uh, last, this time a year ago, when we were talking about the benefits, we, we, we were self-insured, the county pays the claims, and we, the, the insurance company tells us how much in claims they think we're gonna have, and this time a year ago, we were, actually it was in August a year ago, we were looking at about, we were running about 70% of what we were expecting. We did not receive an increase on the expected liability for 2019. We did receive an increase on our fixed costs, which we actually reduced by making changes on the type of insurance we were buying. We actually implemented a new pharmacy benefit, which actually saved us in 2019 almost $950,000. We got lower dispensing fees, lower cost on the drugs, higher rebates back from the pharmaceutical companies. 
Um, we had our wellness fund increase from 26,000 to 40,000. Uh, our Medicare Advantage plan, when it renewed last year, we had a decrease because taxes, called the health insurer fee, were, were actually suspended in 2019, so it caused our, our premiums to come down on that. Um, retiree contributions were reworked this time a year ago. Um, retiree contributions had been manually processed for a number of years, and this time a year ago, we actually got everything put into an electronic system. It got everybody current on what they should be paid based upon when they did retire. <clears throat> that actually got our <coughs> retiree contributions from 225 to 290,000. And then our life insurance and disability renewed this time a year ago. <clears throat> so with all that being said, that was a year ago. Maybe I'm gonna get this right. There we go. <clears throat> now we're into the current year. We are normally here in early September talking to you guys, and we've delayed it because of really a lot of things have gone on since we last met. A year ago when we were meeting, in the previous 12-month period, the county had had approximately 12 million in actual paid claims. When we got together this August to start talking to the benefit committee, the claims had actually increased from 12 million to 15 million over a 12-month cycle. It's so about a 26% increase in our claims. And it came from a variety of rate of reasons of where they came from. <clears throat> Notice our medical claims went up 31%, but pharmacy claims hardly budged. And a lot of that was because of the new pharmacy plan that had been implemented. Mm -hmm. We had 2% more employees on coverage, members on coverage, so that's going to increase claims. But the thing that really drove it was the number of folks under our insurance. And, and we have approximately 2,100 men, women, and children under coverage. And in the previous 12 months, 68 members had approximately 5 million in claims, which is pretty normal. But in the most current 12 months, we had 109 folks have almost $8 million in claims. And that, in a large part of it, is why we saw such a jump in our, in our, in our, in our claims over the years. Um, there's a couple different categories that stuck out. A lot of it was hip and joints, running well above our average. Maternity claims. In the previous 12 months, we had eight maternity claims. The most current 12 months, we had 66. I mean, uh, this was there. Chronic kidney disease, <laughs> cancers, uh, all of them ran well above the normal uh, uh, benchmark that we normally saw. And uh, uh, at the time that the renewal was being released by Blue Cross, this was back in August, they were actually projecting a 40% increase on our claims for next year. And so we uh, <clears throat> thought it was prudent for us to hold off Let's get all the August claims in, let's get all the September claims in, and let Blue Cross reevaluate where we think the claims are going to be for next year. And so that's why we're here a little later in the year, trying to see if indeed our experience has improved. And it has. It has started to, to get a little bit more positive. The other item is emergency room usage. This has been talked about for a couple of years. Um, we had 606 individuals used the uh, uh, 606 emergency room visits that came from 421 individuals and that cost the county just over 1.2 million dollars and so again we've been putting a lot of effort into directing people to appropriate care to get into the urgent care get a relationship with your family doctor uh, making sure that you can use the electronic uh, uh, physician on call that you can get on your smartphone and so we're gonna we're, we're gonna continue those efforts but again it's a huge chunk of money that went into emergency room care ah. <clears throat> there we go <clears throat> so we, we got the renewal release from Blue Cross early in October after seeing September claims and the, the bottom line is, is Blue Cross and Blue Shield 
is looking at an approximate $3.2 million increase in our cost for 2020 if we do nothing. And so it's a pretty substantial change. And I'm not going to go through this slide, but with no benefit changes, they expect claims to be approximately about 3.2 million more than where we are right now. So the benefit committee, uh, we've met several times, and we put a number of options in front of in front of the benefit committee. The most uh, uh, the claims expected next year. I'm going to try not to touch the screen. Next year, 2020, we're expecting the claims without administrative cost, the claims themselves to be at 16.2 million. And so we started looking at some items that we could address. One of them was emergency room. The most glaring, which got us the biggest bang for our money, was the maximum amount of pocket. And what the maximum amount of pocket is, that's the most that any one member has to pay if they get a serious illness, such as if I get cancer, if I have a heart attack, and currently today, once you're deductible, your co-pays and your co-insurance for both medical, pharmacy, and all expenses, under our current plan today, once that reaches $1,750, the Douglas County plan pays 100% of everything. And so what we uh, put forth in front of the benefit committee and what was ultimately accepted was we're changing the maximum out of pocket to any one individual to $4,000. And if you're covering a family, the maximum any one family would have to pay is $8,000. This falls in line very much with what we see in other governments. The state health benefit plan, their, their HMO has a $4,000 maximum out of pocket. So we felt it was very much in line. There were some other changes made. And by making these changes, we were able to get the estimated claims reduced from 16 million point two down to 14 million point three, approximately about a two million dollar decrease in the claims for 2020. <clears throat> so with a revised budget in terms of the cost for the medical, the medical uh, with administrative cost currently is 15.7. We see it with those approved changes by the Benefit Committee going to 17.3, just add a 10% increase. The Medicare Advantage is, is increasing, but it's actually increasing to a level that was right where it was two years ago. And the reason it's increasing is the health insurance fee tax is coming back in 2020. And so the large part of that increase is the t are the taxes being reinstated. Uh, the demo, the vision are all inflationary changes no change on disability or life. So we're seeing the actual cost on the benefits go from a total cost of 17.5 to 19.1. The employee contributions and the retired contributions, we are projecting no change in those. And so the actual total annual increase to the county with these uh, projected save, with these projected cha cha changes approximately 1.6 million for, for 2020. Uh, the deadline in order for us to meet open enrollment is we're asking the BOC to approve these at the next uh, scheduled meeting. Uh, we'd like to start open enrollment the week of October 21st, uh, handing out packets. Employees would be counseled on the, the week of the 28th, and then all decisions would have to be made by November the 15th. And so that is the timeline on it. And uh, again, I want to apologize for bringing it to you so late, but we really had to wait and let more of the claims come in to make sure that we had the best projections for next year. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll conclude. And Frederick, if there's anything you'd like to add. Yep, we're just uh, Any questions open for from questions. Uh, yeah, I do. A couple of questions. Um, this is one committee I'm, I'm not involved in, so I'm always curious though. All right, let's go back to the 66 babies. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. And, and let me add to that. There, there's also, you, when you have children, you have premature babies, you have some sick children, but anyway. But no, yes. No. All right. But, but stay with me. Stay up here. All right. So historically in this county, give, give me roughly, and Fred, you may know this number, but the last three years, four years, you've been saying somewhere between five to ten babies per year. 
right? On average, I don't know the number. That sound good? We can say that. Five to ten. All right. Yeah. So, so stay with me, Pop. Five to ten <coughs> per year were employees, and we jumped to sixty-six. And that was in all this younger people. But, 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 but again, we're talking about employees, right? It's just, well, be dependents. So all right. Be, same family. Sure. Stay with me. The order of magnitude is what gets me. It's, the, it's not a percentage that it went up 10%, 20%. It went up by a multiple of 6x. And I'm like, okay, so what now? What materially changed in our economy that made everybody, you know, hey, we can, whatever it was. But you get my point. That, that, type, of, that type of number requires a, a deeper dive. Like, okay, was it a mistake? Because it's such an anomaly. You, I mean, it went up like off the roof compared to our historical. And so, what material is in the background? What, what was in the water that caused that number? So, we're, are we sure that number is accurate? We've got our mind around it because it is. That, that, it, it, it just makes me like. I will have to say this. I do not know what the number of normal is. <coughs> I, I'm only getting the from 12 to 12. I'd really want to go back maybe a third or fourth year and see what the right. normal, maybe it was 25 or another number other than eight, but it, it did. You, you give a point. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. I mean, that's like eight X based on your numbers, right? That, that, that just, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that go. I'm gonna come back to it, Fred, because I, I wanna know the truth, but we won't do, you can't do it here. All right, um, but, but that being said, um, so now we're, it's gonna, what I heard, the net net, that was a lot. There's gonna be an increase or employees as it relates to contributions. Is that accurate? <coughs> not to contributions. No contributions. Not to the full out of contributions. Pocket. Those won't change. Out of pocket? Yes, sir. All right. All right. And what was the percentage? Just the percentage. I'm just keeping it simple. Let's go back to that slide. Just out of pocket. That one. Not this. Seventeen fifty for persons four thousand out of pocket. That's the increase. One more. Mm -hmm. One more. There, there we go. Twenty-seven. Is Those who use it. Yeah. So it's just out of pocket. Just if. if. Okay. All right. So individuals. So that means our employees. Well, again, these are their own out of pocket expenses. It's not contributions per se coming out of payroll, right? Two hundred percent. Correct. Right. Um, all right. I'm just trying to offset the, the overall scheme of uh, employee and, and the overall compensation and, and what all that means. And we recognize that medical continues to go up. I appreciate what I'm listening to, that there was a fine tuning of the, the different variables, right, associated with health care. Right? Health care is going to continue to go up the expenses, but I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm like, okay, so what does this mean for our employees? All right, I understand what it means for uh, um, obviously um, the provision of government and services, and it's, it's a balancing act. And I'm just listening to how y'all are nudging the numbers um, to make this work to keep the cost down, but yet it, it's a balancing act, right? Uh, and um, we'll, we'll get into the other side of the equation as well because you've got health care, you've got workers' comp, you've got pension. Uh, you, you've got all these things I'm, I'm listening to. This is one component. It's like, okay, now how are we managing this one? But I'm glad to hear that um, obviously what was implemented last year regarding the pharma and you know, all the, Pharmacy. that was great. Um, mm -hmm. um, you, you guys, so you're, you're doing the right things. It's just, I just want to, you know what we're trying to do. We're, we're right. trying to put the, the wellness at the forefront that some of these things like people who they get cancer and the, uh, there was just some of that, I, I, did, I did make this comment during the Mid-Benefit Committee. We had quite a few musculoskeletal claims, and what those are, they're, you're getting the knee and hip replacements, and we, we don't want to be accused of lecturing, but I'm going to lecture. When you carry a lot of extra weight around, it's like putting too much weight in your pickup truck, you're going to wear, wear that suspension out. And when you get older, you start to get in your 40s and 50s, those joints were not made to carry that much weight around. And that's why you're starting to see more and more of that. So when we start preaching about people exercising, maintaining a normal weight, eating right, it has a lot of long-term effects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Duly noted, well said, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Carson. So can we go back to the 4,000 out-of-pocket? 
The reason why that was done basically was to make it a little bit more fair. Is, is, is that the reason? To put us more in line with what other uh, local governments are doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, as, as Matt mentioned in his presentation, the 1,750 is, is, is fairly low. Um, you know, the average being, I believe, is 5,000. For our government clients, we have about 55 government clients, and our average on our block of business, which includes you all, is $5,300, max average out of pocket. And I, and I look at the largest employer here is probably the state, and they're at 4,000. And so we felt that was a, a fair number to be comparable with what, what everyone else is doing. So instead of going up on all of the employees, uh, you know, through uh, contribution, we decided that it would just be more fair to make the out-of-pocket increase. Let, let me, if I can, I'm gonna, can I take it back to the sure. slide? I'm not going to try anymore. <laughs> there we go. Notice the claims are 1.6 million. The employees contribute just add a million dollars. If we charge every employee 20% more, that's $200,000 to help offset the cost, but yet we can make a change up here to where it's, I, I'll use this term, it's more like a user fee. So if I'm eating right, I'm taking care of myself, I'm doing my checkups. If I do have to use it, $4,000 maximum out of pocket is a reasonable expectation versus making everybody, I could go up on everybody's contribution 20%, it doesn't put a dent into what I think we need to do. <coughs> I like it. I think it's fair. Okay. Thank you. I okay, thank you. Mr. McCarthy serves as the uh, chairman of the benefits committee and then I'm the vice chair. So we have spent quite a bit of time just trying to digest this information mm -hmm. and it's beginning to make sense and we understand. Mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, Guy, I believe you're next. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, the out of pocket visit, it, it doesn't include the wellness visits, the, like the checkups and stuff like that. Yeah, your checkups are all free. There's no cost. Okay, so that, that's not going to be effective. That's correct. Um, and I know you, you said that the a lot of the abuse is in the emergency room. Um, now, there are true emergencies that you have to go, but there are often to some people that wait till the weekend and they, their stress <coughs> not any better, so they go to the emergency room. And we have a fine, I mean a penalty now. Have you thought about raising that penalty for non-emergency visits to the ER? We've discussed it, and this is the problem you went into. I eat my hoagie sandwich too fast. I got terrible indigestion. My wife says I'm having a heart attack. I go in there and they tell me it's indigestion, but I think I'm having a heart attack. And so you get into the thought police. Why did the person go in there? And so um, um, Anthem has asked us not to put that in there because then they're trying to read folks' mind. So um, what, we've, what we've done is part of the benefit change is we're asking to raise the ER copay from 200 to 300. And once that copay is hit, then they still have to, employees still have to pay a percentage of the, of the, of the cost. So we're, we're trying not to financially cripple somebody who really needs it but we are trying to really get their attention. Now, starting January 1, we're adding a, another layer of, of assistance from Anthem. Currently today, if you have non-emergency use of the emergency room, if you contact Blue Cross on their customer service line, the operators on their end can see that and they will remind you that you need to make sure you're going to your doctor or urgent care using the telemobile app. But starting January 1, we've added a feature to where now you're going to get a phone call from Anthem if you use the emergency room inappropriately, and they're going to call you and just remind you there's other avenues rather than using the emergency room. So now we're going to even have a physical outreach to people who use it. Well, uh, uh, my husband's had a lot of scans and things like that, and you go to Wellstar and it's $4,000. You can go to uh, an image company and get it for less than a thousand. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's a big part of all this uh, skeletal 
things and everything because uh, Wellstar should not be charging as much if it's uh, that you could go to a private place and have the same image done for a lot less. We need to look at that, I really think. That's widespread throughout the industry. The hospitals know the insurance companies have to contract with them. And the imaging is one of the ones that they just rake them over the coals. And we let folks know that if you go to a freestanding imaging center that's not associated with the facility, the charges are 75% less. I mean, they're, they're just off the but charts. But you have to pay it all out of your pocket if you're under HMO, right? Well, all, all these freestanding imaging uh -huh. facilities, almost all of them are on both networks. Oh, they are? Mm -hmm. Okay, I did that for that. Uh, I'll what happens, that next it, time. It, and again, I don't want to be critical of any health care system, but a lot of the health care oh, systems have purchased a lot of practices, mm -hmm. and those practices refer you back to the facilities that own their practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's natural, it's business, you know, they want you to use the same facility, but the reality of it is the freestanding uh, facilities are just quite a bit less. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, that's good to know, and we need to get the word out about that, too. Uh, now, several years back, and I can't remember if it passed or not, maybe uh, Jennifer or Mark will remember, if you had a married couple, uh, <coughs> that if the, your spouse had insurance with their, with their company, then they had to use them as a primary and us as a secondary. Did that pass? Well, yeah. then that wasn't a requirement. The yeah, requirement was, was that if you so did that and it was available and you didn't use it, then you had to pay a spousal third sure, sure. truck. Like, what, 25 bucks? 25 per thing you did. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so if your spouse has insurance available, uh -huh. but it was declined and both the husband and the spouse are on county insurance, then you have to pay that $25 spousal. Surcharge. What do you mean it was declined? You mean They're not using their companies. The wife has not owned their her companies or the husband. Oh, okay. Their insurance. But if and it's available because they're on ours, then they have to pay the surcharge. Okay, but if they are covered by their company, they have to use that as their primary? The spouse? So I don't know that. They would. Well, typically, they wouldn't be on both. Right. They would they would be on either or. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a spouse and they have access to uh, medical care on their job, whatever that monthly cost is, they'll pay that. It's highly unlikely that they would be on our insurance as well paying. I think what, what was happening is they declined it because our plan was better. Mm -hmm. that, is that right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what was happening. Mm -hmm. Our plan is very good. Yeah. Compared, yeah. But that's but, why they'll be on our plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But and there's just a twenty five dollar. Mm -hmm. Well, we might want to look at that <laughs> to encourage him to use their other plan. Uh, I think part of the other thing that happened going back several years ago, an employee could either take single or family coverage. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of years ago, we, we strivated it to where you could cover just your spouse or cover just your kids. Yeah. And we put in the working spouse rule. And uh, I, I don't remember the number, it's $25, $25. per pay period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've had quite a few of the employees drop spouses mm -hmm. because now they get a lower cost on their deduction. Mm -hmm. right. When it was just family, then it didn't right. cost them any more to have their spouse and their children. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, okay, all right. But I'm just throwing those things out there, but I do know that the scans cost a lot more when you go to the hospital yeah. than you go somewhere else. I yield back. Okay, thank you. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah. And then also, <laughs> Matt, you get a very good presentation, and um, board commissioners, thank you for just uh, taking the time to listen. We had six or six babies, uh, and those six or six babies will be added to our insurance as well. But I also want to just mention, um, Matt, that $950,000 savings in the pharmacy was huge. That was something that uh, and I, so, I tried, I'm shy sometimes about making suggestions or taking credit in, in public, but uh, that was something that we discussed. I found that because, you know, working in healthcare, pharmacy is, is the impact. Because uh, it, I, I was hoping that generic drugs would be an option and it seems like it's working. We have some folks that have to have the formulary that requires them to take the required drug, drug from the physician, but 
it seems like it's working. It's, it's actually working. So thank you for allowing my suggestion to move forward with that. That was, that was a and big Madam one. Chair, we do have a recommendation that we'd like for the board to consider for vote on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have that recommendation? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, what is the recommendation? I'm sorry. Is it on a different? Is it one more? Last page, probably. Yes, it's the last page. There it is. Oh, oh, Stay there. So we're, yeah. Maybe so we're yeah. we're recommending uh, that we move forward with option D, uh, which would uh, uh, move forward with that out of pocket max of four thousand and um, an eight thousand dollar family. And we do want to, to uh, Matt, if you would uh, expound on the eight thousand being just double the uh, the individual and not triple. That is correct. Currently, the the out of pocket is three times the individual under our current plan so that if I've got three family members who get really under the weather, the maximum out of pocket for the family is 5250 But it, by going to a $4,000 individual out of pocket, we're limiting the, um, the family to two times, 8000 mm -hmm. So we'd like to move forward with that recommendation for the board to consider uh, uh, voting on uh, tomorrow to approve and uh, we uh, that timeline that uh, that Matt talked about earlier we can move forward with that start getting our books printed and uh and everything else involved with open enrollment mm -hmm. okay. yes. okay thank you all right, thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, we have one more presentation, but before we do, before I do that, I want to move into just a few of those business items that I know that will move real quickly. We have tab number eight, authorization to accept the uh, FY19 Ethel Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant JAG program in the amount of $16,419 with no required matching funds for the grant fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2019 through uh, September 30th, 2020, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And, a bit, uh, and amend the budget as necessary. Jennifer King, uh, Ms. King, uh, what are the issues you heard? This is um, just our JAG grant that we get every year. We were awarded the $16,419 with no matching funds. Okay. Any questions from the board? It's pretty cut and dry. Thank you. I didn't want to hold you. Okay, Jennifer, you have one more <laughs> authorization to amend the contract with Douglas <coughs> Corps to re, uh, reflect FY20 budget cut from the state and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Director King. Yes, ma'am. There was a um, state cut that we received notice of to cut the funding 4%. Um, so the original grant amount goes from 50000 to 48000 and we just need to amend the contract to reflect that amount. Any questions from the board? Yeah. yeah, is there, all right, so the budget um, is amended. Is that a salary impact? I mean, how, how does that impact, what, what's being impacted? I'm just looking for relative, you don't have to go deep. Um, the contract is with CORE as a body, so yeah. whatever they're doing with the money is, I got you. we don't have control of it. Okay, so it's just oversight. So, yes. um, but yet they do give accounting back to you regarding reporting and monthly or whatever yes yes and then you report up to the state is that how it works yes have we ever taken that jennifer muhammad have we looked at that report before it's the one from core uh -huh. i don't believe so i think that's something that y'all get but we yeah we just have um jill has just submitted our first um quarterly report yep to be reviewed and looked at can we get a copy of that, please? Sure. Absolutely. Send that. Thank you. Okay. Are you okay. okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you so much, uh, Director King. <coughs> and then we have somebody come to here, our, our Solicitor General, uh, authorization to accept the renewal of our Victims of Crime Act BOCA grant in the total amount of $148,668 with a local match of $29,734 through the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, which is CJCC, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Uh, Solicitor General. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. 
Morning. As Madam Chair just stated, we're here to present um, the Victims of Crime Act, the VOCA grant, uh, asking you all to accept it. The amount is $1,468,000, I'm sorry, with a local match of $29,734,000, which most of that um, is accomplished through our volunteer hours, and a part of it is through um, our coordinator's grant. Um, I'm sorry, part of her salary as well is covered. I think the amount, 18% eight, of that is covered. Okay. So we're asking you all to accept it. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioner Mitchell. So, so if I'm hearing you right, correct. 18% of it is covered. Correct. Uh, and the, the rest is it's coming out of where? The budget. Out of the budget. Yeah. You already got it there. We need to or, or we need to kind of uh, account for that. Uh, no, it's not. Oh. I'm sorry, Mayor. Right. Right. Come on. Right. The budget isn't changing at all. It's been we've had it since 2015. What um, Ms. Compton was referring to is part of my salary is actually used as a match, okay. matching fund, and so we use volunteer hours. You want to go to the whole thing? Sure. Um, I told you to come up here. Oh, no. So a portion, of, a portion of my salary is actually, actually used as a match, so we don't have to pay anything extra yeah. from the budget. And um, we also use volunteer hours. We get right. $15 per hour for volunteer hours. So that's used as a match as well. So, so, so it's, it's all covered, is, I guess. It's all yes, in, in kind. Yes. In, yes, sir. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Is it in kind? I mean, it's technically money. It's not in yeah, kind of volunteer you, I, hours, I, I, but it's already right. in the budget okay. anyway. And then any extra, if, there, if it's something comes out where the spending is different, we, have to do, we do have to pay a little extra. But it all comes out of our budget that's already there. Understood. The budget doesn't change at all. Yes. Okay. As my colleague said, budget neutral. I guess. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I yield back. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Princess. There you go. Thank you for explaining to us. Thank you. Thank you. I can help you all with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then we have. Uh, I'll just go with one more. Then we'll go into the SPLOS, um presentation because everybody else that's in the room will be affected by this presentation, and also you need to be here for your uh, committee updates. Uh, tab number 11, authorization for the chairman to execute a contract with Lenise Harrington as assistant public defender in the state court. <coughs> Hello. Hello, good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'll start out. This request has no impact on the budget. Okay. We had one of our uh, attorneys who worked in state court as assistant public defender left and took a job in Atlanta working for their public defender's office. So we need to fill that vacant position and we've hired Lenise Harrington. She comes from actually Rockdale Public Defender's Office, so she'll be joining our office. So that's our request. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Yeah. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I do. All right, so um, how are we doing public defender-wise? Uh, and, and to your point, we're, we're, we're losing um, some employees to the, the, the bigger market. It, it, it is what it is. Yes, sir. Uh, and we're uh, recruiting from probably moderate-sized markets, our, our, our contemporaries. We know how, you know, the food chain moves. Uh, but how are you doing pound for pound uh, as, um, from a public defender's perspective with our DA? I mean, obviously, it's something I love. We had a constitutional officer retreat recently, and this is something I'm, I'm pretty vocal about, making sure there's, um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be equal, but it needs to be equitable representation. Um, obviously, a DA is the largest law firm we have here in the county, um, and they outgun y'all probably maybe two to three. How are y'all keeping up with this in light of, you know, you got to come before those judges, and you got to have your act together. Can you, I'm giving you a moment now. I appreciate so, that. Yeah. Um, well, we do the best we can. Obviously, the attorneys in our office share, we share two to three attorneys per one administrative staff person. So we do not have our own individual staff people. In addition, each of those shared staff folks have a lot of other duties besides just supporting the attorneys. I mean, a lot of them are doing office manager duties, billing with all the conflict attorneys. There's just a lot of other, they just have a lot of other duties besides just being support staff. So a lot of the attorneys are doing their own administrative work as well as doing law work. Um, I mean, yeah, we just, it, but that's always been the way it is. The public defender's office doesn't quite get the same staffing because we're not 
as popular, I guess. And, you know, <laughs> not, not, not with the county, I don't mean to say that, but just with the public in general because of the nature of our jobs. But I just, we just try to hire really skilled people and train them and try to keep them. It's just hard. A lot of folks will come from other public defenders' offices to work for us. We have a good reputation. They're also trying to get closer to Atlanta. And we're just that much closer to Atlanta. So you can get into Douglas County, then you kind of folks know, hey, they did a good job in Douglas County, then they'll get hired in Fulton County. Mm -hmm. And it's just hard to compete with that. Training ground, bigger market. I mean, at the end of the day, people are there. I, I get it. Um, but, but to that point, um, um, so in addition to your normal day in life, now we're um, the complexity of uh, accountability course, the overlay, um, the hand holding that typically has to go into that. I mean, how are we? Um, are we? Do you have the bandwidth? Do we need more attorneys? I mean, what? 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 Could this, this go? We, I mean, we do need more attorneys. I sh um, we have requested to have an additional attorney for the budget for next year. The accountability courts do take a lot of time and a lot of work. Absolutely, we only have one person who serves all the state court yep. and the superior court accountability courts, and well as the mental health support. So we definitely need another. We need more help. Yes. Right. So you asked for you did ask for one attorney and one legal assistant doing. Um, we asked for one attorney for the next year's budget. Okay. All right. I, I just want to do that for the record because there was no press at our Constitution <coughs> Office Retreat, and I just wanted to make that a record. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll move to our SWAS presentation at this point. Are you ready? Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Members of the board. My name is Terry Gable with Marlon Altabelli, and I'll be doing the. The October SPLOS update. We don't have it. revenues uh, for 2019 August revenues the work through September uh, we'll cover that um, the August month was the 29th month out of the 72 for the program which is about 40% of the, the overall program as far as time um, invoice to date through September uh, for all three uh, project programs was we're inching up close to the $30 million mark was right at uh, $28.4 million. Uh, looking at each program individually, Fire and EMS, Fire, Fire and EMS stayed basically about the same as it did last month with not much change. Obviously with Motorola uh, starting to wrap up that project, getting going towards the end of the year, and certainly towards the end of the uh, SPLOS year three, we'll see that, that jump up. Transportation had the, uh, the biggest increase Right at $800,000 of his invoice in transportation uh, in, through the month of September. It puts him up at about $9.7 million. And then finally, Parks and Rec, um, slightly slight increase of about $100,000 Parks and Rec. It puts him about $2.5 million uh, for, through the a month of September. So, in continuing on with the revenues, so August revenues. Uh, came in uh, pretty solid. We were above, again, above the projection line, uh, which is good. That's, that's our target, is to keep the, uh, hopefully keep the revenues coming in uh, above that and try to sustain that through the program. Uh, the actual number for August was $2.2 .2 million. It was about $180,000 over projections. So the last few months, we've been running pretty steady with that. Um, of course, as we get into the holiday season, We'll hope to continue that. Uh, overall, in year three, just looking at year three, we've got about $1.1 million overage uh, total for the year. And then if you look at the uh, total revenues for all three years, which brings it up to our current month of, of uh, August, uh, where total SPLOS revenues was $60.7 million. 
Uh, the original projection was 58.3 million, and the total overage was 2.3 million. <clears throat> so the numbers are still looking pretty solid, <clears throat> and again, hopefully we can keep sustain that through uh, certainly through the rest of the year three. And looking at the the bond <coughs> the, the bond service and the payment obligations, uh, we've gone past the October 1st deadline. That payment was $959,000, and that was the uh, uh, payment was made. The next, uh, the larger, again, this was the, the biggest payment for the for the payback over the uh, for the bond. April 1st of 2020 would be the next one. That's $18.9 million to be paid at that point. And again, all the revenues of uh, until we collect that amount of money, no, and none of the revenues are going towards project program. <clears throat> All right, so we'll move into uh, some updates on our projects. Uh, starting off with fire uh, on the county-wide digital radio system. Um, so Motorola continues to move forward with the uh, with the overall project. Uh, they're, they're currently still on schedule and <coughs> under budget. We're still waiting on the uh, on the agreement uh, to be executed from FCC and SHPO. I understand they're kind of back and forth with uh, with editing each other's documents and. Uh, hopefully we'll get that signed uh, any any day now. Um, Motorola has managed to do some work at the site, but they cannot complete it um, until we until they get that, that final signed document uh, from FCC and SHPO. So hopefully we're close with that. And again, it's not uh, it's not it's it's hurts a little bit on that one site, but overall Motorola has been able to continue to order radios. We've had training going on with Mock Alert. Um, and so they've been able to continue doing work uh, through this downtime of getting trying to get that um, <coughs> trying to get that agreement signed. See if it'll work this time. Well, all right. Okay. So. I think it brings, I guess we'll do it without the presentation, but, which is fine. Um, and staying with fire, the ambulance procurement for it, there was one for 20, 2019. Um, <coughs> Chiefs are expecting delivery on that this month. Uh, and we have one fire truck also that, that was purchased, um, that we'll be purchasing. Uh, we expect delivery of that, of that fire truck in the spring of uh, 2020. It is in fabrication, um, but we'll do, do expect some uh, a lengthy time frame to get that truck built and in the operation. And then the, uh, the the station three renovations projects that we have kept in, kept on the presentation. We finally completed the punch list for it. The warranty items have been completed. It's just a matter of uh, of tidying that project up and paying the final retainage. On it, and we'll we'll show that project is complete and in the um, project complete list. Staff vehicles for the chief, uh, not much change there. We uh, the the thought was to order three vehicles, uh, and in this last year we we've taken delivery of one. The second one is being worked on currently, and, and <clears throat> chief and them are getting some final equipment uh, installed on it. Once that is complete. We've got the final invoice on that. We'll make he'll make a decision on the third vehicle and what the budget allows as far as what they can purchase and equip up. Um, and last but not lot least, right now, so we we I've talked about Station Nine construction, um, the fire station nine. This will be a new a new building in Southeast Douglas. Um, we've been looking at that project closely as so we'll have the whole program. Right now, construction is shown out. This project's not at risk. It is above the, the risk line. It's, it's within the budget, it's, but it is shown out in year five as far as, or year six as far as construction. We'll probably delay, uh, the recommendation would be to delay at least the design on it. So we don't have, we don't get, we don't get the project designed and it's set on the table for any length of time that would cause us to have to go back and update the plans. So um, we'll stay on top of that. And as we move through the program, uh, any chances of moving that that project uh, up in the program to speed it up. We'll certainly do that, but right now we'll we'll hold off on going out with RFPs for design at least through uh, year three. And once we get into year four, we'll we'll start uh, 
um, reanalyzing that project. And again, right now, construction is shown in year six for it, and, and the funding is shown to be there. So with that in fire, I'll move into transportation. Uh, the research and program, which includes the L MIG roads, is ongoing with the CW Matthews. They're on schedule and, and, and on budget right now. So everything is uh, is moving along just fine with um, with the resurfacing program. Uh, the pavement evaluations that was done by Moore and Altabelli was um, presented to the board September 30th. An overview and the uh, the initial report that we that was needed for Miguel to start making selections for the upcoming year uh, has been provided uh, to the board. Um, right now, the only remaining thing that we need to get, and uh, we're working on that currently, is to get the license that will be turned over to Miguel's office, and also do a short training class to get, get them started out with the uh, with the paper system and make sure they've got everything they need to start utilizing the, the program. Um, with that, I'll move into the uh, the intersections. Stewart Mill Road, first one up, at Reynolds Road. We've got several of them that are now in the right of way phase. This one is in, is, is, is in the right away phase with about eight parcels. I mentioned that last last month. So once um, and the final plans have been submitted to Miguel for review. Um, once we get the right away we move through that phase of it, we'll be ready to start construction on this project. Um, so we're looking at sometime in the spring of 2020 for uh, for um, to let it to construction. And again, I'll just be uh, gazed on, on when Miguel can get the right way done. Uh, Bright Star Road at, at John West Road is the uh, the next intersection. This one is ready to let. It's in Miguel's queue to get get it uh, into procurement and be let. So we're looking forward to getting this project out. Um, again, out on the street. Uh, uh, sometime uh, it, towards the end of with this fall, uh, we should be looking to get this project lit. Moving on to Sweetwater Road at Doris Road. Um, uh, the low bid for this project has been approved. We're just waiting on the executed contract from the contractor. Um, we expect that uh, any day now. And we'll be able to start construction on, on this long-awaited Sweetwater Church Road at Doris Road. Uh, we're expecting completion of that in the summer of 2020. This should be wrapping it up, pending good weather and, and no delays on the project. <coughs> And with that, uh, moving to talk about Chapel Hill Road. Um, the design is ongoing with this. This was the larger of the intersection projects uh, and utility coordination has started. We're hoping to have Miguel uh, right away plans by the end of the year. Uh, once, he, once he gets those and they can start setting the schedule for the right of way, we anticipate in looking at all next year for Chapel Hill Road, uh, all of 2020 will probably be dedicated for Miguel's office, our own call consultant doing the um, uh, acquiring the right away for that project. Um, and once we move through that through next year, we'll we'll be a little closer to knowing exactly what lead dates will be and, and um, a completion date for it. Highway five at Douglas Boulevard. This is the right turn lane on Highway five. Um, Miguel's in the process of uh, working with. Uh, the on-call consultant uh, negotiate the price. Once that's done, he'll be uh, that'll have to go through the approval process with the, through the, the committee and through the board. And um, we're expecting the design to start on that project uh, certainly by the end of the year once we work through the, the uh, approval process. And then that takes me to Post Road Bridge at Dog River. We are down to one parcel on that on that project. Uh, Miguel's working through some issues with it, but he's he, we've got a target to get that acquired uh, very soon, and then it'll just be down to the contractor, GDOT's contractor, being able to mobilize into Douglas County. We expect that uh, early next year, and we'll keep you posted on their, their stats. Um, our three sidewalk projects, long-awaited sidewalk projects, uh, we're down to one parcel of right-of-way um, to acquire. Uh, for the Lithia Springs and for the Chestnut Log. Not expecting any issues with that. Um, hopefully we'll have this project uh, let um, either towards the end of the year or first of 2020 and certainly completed by the summer of 20, 
2020 as far as the overall project. And that goes for both uh, Lithia Springs and Chestnut Lawn. And then finally, the new Manchester High School. There's no right of way there. As I've reported before, it is primarily just getting GDOT's approval on the uh, on the permit to uh, for the work we're going to be doing on there right away. Uh, and just make no problems with it. We've got the projects designed. As soon as we get the approval back, we'll be able to move forward with with letting that project. Um, that brings me to Whitestone Culvert. It's, it's under construction. The contractor started in September. Um, Roughly a nine month completion date on it. And that, again, we've got several projects, hopefully, be, be finishing up in transportation. And this is one of them, uh, the summer of 2020. Um, we should have, a, have that road open back up with a new, new culvert. The, uh, moving on to the street lights uh, that we're, the project we're currently working on now, we've, uh, that we've been reporting on is the I 20 at all the interchanges. GDOT, this is again falls in GDOT's lap. We've got to get a permit. Um, GDOT's reviewing the plans that have been submitted by Greystone and Georgia Power. Once that's approved, both of them will be able to set schedules for that and we'll, we'll start reporting on uh, when the work starts and, and time frames for that. No issues, just a matter of working through GDOT um, to, get it, to get it accomplished. Um, the Highway 92 at Mount Vernon the traffic signal. Again, a lot, another long-awaited uh, project that we're looking to get a contractor out there. The GDOT is uh, in their procurement process. We'll get our contractor on board. It should go fairly quickly. Uh, and then it'll be a matter of them uh, starting work and, and getting that signal and poles uh, installed. Uh, and here, they're talking to Miguel about materials with all the work going on. That could delay the, the time frame of the project, depending on if there's a delay in getting the materials, which I'm referring to the poles, may delay it uh, going into the uh, first part of 2020. Um, but we'll know that once we get the contract on board and find out their um, material orders. Uh, the next interchange is, uh, or intersection is Highway 92 <coughs> Riverside Parkway. Again, this will be done by one of the on-call consultants. Um, Miguel is working through that process um, to get bringing them on board and get that design started uh, this year. Hopefully, if not, it'll be the first part of 2020. Lee Road, the Lee Road widening project, no change there. The, uh, Michael Baker's continuing to update the plans. Uh, so we'll right now the schedule is to. Uh, uh, the, the proposed schedule is to let this project uh, by June of next of next year. Obviously, that's something we're still working through with GDOT, uh, with the county um, uh, SPLOS program, and with Miguel's office to try to tie that down and find out what's feasible as far as timing on, on the Lee Road project. But we're certainly looking at it very close. And with that, it finishes up updates on the transportation program. And we'll move into, I'll move into parks real quick. Um, so we've got three key projects that are out right now for bids and, and parks. Deer Lake uh, Park Tennis Courts is the first one. Those bids are due next Friday, um, October the 18th. And we'll start, <clears throat> uh, that'll be turned over to the review committee uh, to start looking at those bids. And then our next two big vertical projects is the Recreation Center and the Senior Center, those are tracking identical. The bids are due for those on October 25th. And keep your fingers crossed. We did get good responses from both, all three projects actually. Uh, we got um, a lot of interest in, in certainly the Senior Center. Um, good contractors for the Rec Center, so that's, that's a good start. Um, hopefully we'll keep the bids very competitive and we'll, um, we'll have it, uh, like I said, have them all in by the end of uh, next week. And we'll be able to take a hard stance on our parks budget and see where we're at overall. Uh, the only other two projects that are sitting on hold uh, that are dependent on, on where our bids come in, obviously, is the Bill Art Park and, and Fair Play. And we've got those. Uh, if you remember, that was bid out back in April. And we've got those on hold right now until we, uh, we get these bids in on the other three projects. So with that, um, I seem to go through it even quicker without the PowerPoint. So, 
I'll uh, I'll let yeah. question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, I do appreciate the time that it takes to go through this. Uh, it is important because of the dollar that we're spending on behalf of the citizens. So if this is the only visibility that we have, and it, it's worth the time. So your, your, your time that you took work was appropriate. That being said, um, um, I don't want to call it fired EMS. I'm going to come back to... Um, savings uh, from the trans, what they call it, trans, whatever, communications tower. Um, and one more time for the record, um, the savings from that cannot be used to fund anything within our share of cars. Is that accurate? And, and, and Mark, y'all can weigh in. Is that accurate? Savings? Um, and can the radios, I think the radios are part of the uh, system. But not specifically tires or cars themselves. No, kind of. no cars, no, no nothing. And again, I, I just sit here and I cringe, and I, and I appreciate the need for our, our fire and EMS for them to get support in this loss. But the, the sheriff just, I, I just, I have an issue, and I'm always, I'm thoughtful of how we can help um, leverage it and, and make sure they're taken care of as well. Um, they are very important first responders out there on the front line, and we need to equip them. And so we had a, a great opportunity here to do so, and we choose not to. Uh, and so uh, you, you can't run from that reality of decisions that we make. Like I tell my son, when you do certain things, you have to you know, live with your decision. And, and sometimes it's sort of like a blue screen. You can't go back and do a do-over. And so, but it's like, okay, now how do we move forward? So uh, do we, is that, are we certain, and Ken, weigh in on this one, and I won't go long, guys. Legally, is there a legal position that we can take to this, but what if we, is there a way forward that we could use that savings from the communications tower to to um, help offset costs associated with share cars? It's a very specific question. In yeah, and I, I think I analyzed this for the county administrator previously, previously, and I think his response is correct based on the way that referendum was worded. So, I, you know, I can go back and recheck it again, but Mark, I think that's what I told you tonight. Yes, sir. That's yeah. correct. Right, so we, we, legally, because it was a, a <coughs> referendum, we're saying that we, we really we can't do it. There's no workaround. Well, that's the referendum was set up in percentages and had three categories. And that's it. while the savings can be rolled into those categories, proportional, they can't be rolled into new things outside those categories. The way it was written, you, the, the referendum was very broad to give you a lot of discretion within those categories and even to change things within those categories. But it didn't allow. It does not allow you to go outside those categories by breaking out. That makes sense. I understand. So there was no wording in there that said public safety. We were very, actually it wasn't very broad. It was actually mm -hmm. very finite when you said fire EMS versus just saying well, public safety. Categories were specific, but the actual projects were not listed. They could be changed at the board's discretion within uh, those categories. All right. So stay with me. We said transportation, right? Martin, you have it. Yes. Transportation. Fire and EMS and public radio system and uh, parks and recreation. Right, so transportation, broad, anything on transportation um, or public works, uh, parks and rec, which is obviously one of the seven major categories that Jennifer keeps up with per se. And then we get down to, which is fire and EMS, which is really an administrative general government function, but um, um, obviously public safety was not covered. So I, that's all I'm, I'm just like, geez. All right, I'm not going to belabor that, but, but, but duly noted. I mean, I'm only bringing this up because we're going into a budget cycle, right? We're going into a very real budget cycle. And we're, 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 we as a, an administration are trying to find creative ways to, to undo some things that have been done to sort of play forward, right? So you, you, you keep testing it. You keep pushing on it. And, and it's like, ah, you know. But if we fall flat or we come up short, recognize it's not for the fact that we, oops, we didn't plan for it. Um, it just wasn't planned for it. We're trying to make do for what we've got. All right, next thing is, um, you talked about, um, what do you want to call it, these vertical buildings. And um, all right, so let's go back to, again, back to um, uh, all the projects that have been programmed. Uh, you, it was $70 million, and Jennifer, stay with me, $70 million that was bonded um, on this first round. No, not not the Sploss Penny that's coming in. This we went and took a loan from the street to sort of go ahead and get started with our projects, right? Forty. Actually, I'm sorry, seventy. Seventy. I mean, sixty. 
around 4020. It was 4020, I thought it was. Or 4520. Right. So it's around 65 million. Okay, so city got 2025. 20. 20. Right. And so we got 45, not including the program managers, um, full points and, and fees from all the professionals, right? Mm -hmm. 70 million, right? <clears throat> All right, so 65. Okay. Please confirm that before today. Sure. All right, um, for two o'clock. All right, so I'm going to go with my 70 because that's easier math. Okay. All right, so for $70 million that we bonded all in, that means that roughly we had about 40 million. How much is this plot supposed to generate? What did we forecast? Jennifer? Around 115. And 30 something for total. Mm -hmm. Our portion would be somewhere around 106. So, that was with, that's with the, the that's with the uh, increase in sales each year that we anticipated. Very good. Okay, that's fine. So, 130, but we take away 106, 107 for easy math. So that means that roughly we've got somewhere between 70 and 105 for easy math. We got about 35 million dollars that perhaps we could bond. Yes or no? To perhaps um, fulfill cash. Yes or no? Yes, to go out to the market again because we yeah. didn't bull, borrow at full capacity the first time, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and that um, that was a referendum that was passed by the public which says that we can go out for the full amount. We just chose as an administration to only do port proportion, correct? Because we're only allowing, correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, that we can only borrow what we anticipate <coughs> on spending in the three years because of arbitrage, spend down requirements, correct? Yes. We're spending faster, but okay, so to that point, so what? We knew we I, couldn't spend all of it in the three years. I understood, but when I hear we're trying to accelerate projects, mm -hmm. does that put me in jeopardy of arbitrage? Because again, in, in our, our, our finance, we'll bring it up. I just mm -hmm. want to make that note because he, he said it. All right, so my point being is that as we look at this, and we're trying to, uh, we're, we're, I'm trying to be creative and say, okay, but how does everybody need to get that? Um, Nothing is guaranteed on the project list. We all know that. You know, all costs are coming in. There's absolutely no guarantee on any project, perhaps on the list, from a priority perspective. And it's important that we set the public's expectation because, again, we just don't know what the future is going to hold. Let's eat the sandwich that's currently on the plate and see how this thing comes off. Um, the other thing that I, I look at, and, and to your point, is that the county um, is carrying the city's on this, is that correct? In other words, it was based on the county's credit rating. Is that accurate? That is correct. All right, so the, the, the county uh, is carrying the city, in this case, our credit rating, so they're really, they're paying us if that's the way it works out. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is correct. Okay, so we're carrying the city, so not only have our credit covered the whole county and all that we're doing, but it's including the cities. Right, don't forget that, all of we're, we're carrying the full load. That was by design. All right, this, this is not Fulton to Atlanta where you've got 98% is the municipalities and stuff. The county has a very big footprint. All right, we, 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 we do a lot of heavy lifting. And so I want to make sure that the credit and acknowledgement is given to this, this county's administration. Um, that was deliberate to, to not, you know, let the city go their own way. It's like, no, we'll, we'll, we'll carry this. We'll, 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 not only, we didn't ask you to co-sign it, we'll carry it fully. You just pay us back when you get around to it. Right, that's important. All right, as we go into these budget cycles, to really acknowledge what the county has done with the funds that the public has blessed us with. All right, all right. so I'm, I'm on this finance thing as we go into the end of the year. You guys know how I get. So finally, um, on this last part, um, um, recasting. Today in the Finance Committee, do, um, County Administrator, you can answer this. Um, are we prepared for both the finance um, group as well as the SPLOS group? to have um, a, a refined reforecast of the SPLOS and everything. Yes, sir. Okay. Then I won't belabor that, Madam Chairman, we'll just wait and not preempt that. But I just want to make sure, again, as we're, as we're taking a step back, we're like, okay, we got a lot of needs, guys. You can't get to everything. Everything that wasn't done in the past 30 years is not going to get done in the next three years. It's not going to happen. We're not going to feel bad because we can't get to it. But there needs to be a proper plan that says, okay, how do we carry this forward? How do we carry this forward? So I want to, uh, I'm sure I asked the finance committee to sort of sharpen their pencils and stuff, and then we'll talk about it then to make sure that we got, we got that. It's more of a monthly. I don't need no relative. I don't need no, um, you know, sort of a, a, a dull, um, I want to say butter knife on this. We need to have accuracy. Uh, and it's just really, 
Madam, uh, I'm hogging it's all about the cash flow. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm after, making sure the timing of that cash flow is coming in, that we're not just sort of, because you got the project team and they're just rolling. They don't have to worry about cash flow. They just, you know, they just to keep the project going. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at Jennifer, like, wait a minute, hold on now. They coming in hot and nobody's really over there. They just doing the project. Come on, come before the committee. They're just going, they're going, they're going. And it's important that we synchronize that cash flow on the other side. Like, okay, guys, all right now. Yes, a spreadsheet. I created a spreadsheet that had all of the um, income, the SPLOS coming in as well as the debt service being paid. Then that was handed over to Moreland Altabelli for them to project um, the spending um, because that's not anything that I'm aware of. But I can tell you what we projected for SPLOS to come in in every month. I can tell you what the debt service is going to be every year. Then they were to fill in the outgoing while I have been coming and so we have that spreadsheet. And we'll be prepared to discuss that today at two o'clock. Yes. All right, that's all I need. Now Jerry, you go to my colleagues. <coughs> Commissioner Fiber. Yes, and I want some clarification from Kenny. Uh, say the radio system. Say it comes in under budget like um, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And we accomplish our goal and then we've gotten all the peri peripherals, uh, you know, the stuff that has to go with it in the trucks and, and, and things like that. After we've exhausted our need, you're saying we can't do anything with that money? We can't put it in the overage money that is being collected uh, on a sales tax? Or I'm, I'm pulling out the referendum so I've got it in front of me when I'm talking about this to make sure we are clear about what I'm saying. So the way this was broken down, it, the specific categories, mm -hmm. because you don't have specifically laid out projects, you have flexibility in projects, there really is never an over or under, it's based on categories and percentages. So if you have cost savings within a category, that cost savings can be recast for projects within that category. Whereas if you had had specific projects that you had underages, then you would have an obligation to refund the taxpayers or offset their taxes the following when you ran that court let's say you ran you had three three projects specifically the jail a park and this and you had cost savings you can't unless the projects become obsolete you have to recast that in the form of tax savings off the bottom line in future years in this particular spot where you have categories but not projects savings within the category could be recast for the projects if that makes sense within so the way the this was worded your flexibility is you didn't name specific projects you had an idea list but that idea list could be changed by the board at any time was it but the uh radio system was that just firing ems or public safety it, it, what the, was it was really the included in that fire ems yeah. category so it's part of the fire and EMS category. It's fire, so we EMS, and public register. Anything system. as far as the fire, once we pay yeah. for it, the we fire and EMS, it just right. for fire and EMS Correct. purposes. And I'm pulling it up so I can make sure, but I, my, my recollection of the, word, the way that was worded was that it was within the same sentence of fire, EMS, and public radio system. So a savings within that block, whatever percentage that was, would be recast for the other broad categories within that block. And we did some research earlier about making sure that we could recast that for, or we could use it for public radio systems, uh, the public tie-in to the radio system. So we've already made that jump. Uh, okay, if I can broach two subjects real quick. One, in the city's portion of that SWAS referendum, there specifically said public safety. Ours did not. That's the difference in the two. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other thing, when I was answering Jennifer's question, I was looking up, so I want to make sure I answer this right. You have borrowing power within the SPOS up to the cap for bond, whatever the bond is, and I think we had room cap. But when we forecast, when we forecast bondability, what you're looking for is you don't want to be sitting on income that's going to be subject to federal taxes because you're in a holding pattern rhythm. Mm -hmm. So arbitrage really has to do with not your ability to borrow, but your ability to hold that money tax-free as a reinvestment yeah, to get return and use it. So when they're making their judgments, they're making on judgments, and Jennifer's relying on outside folks and staff and everybody else. What can we, what projects 
can we commit to up front in the first three years so that the money I'm holding and reinvesting is not being subject to taxes for purposes of or rebated back. Or rebated back. That's correct. So that's the, the arbitrage has to do with taxation and rebate, rebate, not your ability to borrow. You do have some borrowing capability, I think, still left in the SPLOS from 16. But the question is, what projects do you need it? Do you need, you need it? to borrow? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know how are you funding it? And is it? I think the I think the balance between staff and and the commission at the time was what is up front versus what is pay as you go. But you do have borrowing capability still left on SPLOS. The city chose to take all of its money. So when we bonded, the city got all of its 100% of its money because it was a lower amount. But we still have borrowing capability mm -hmm. on that SPLOS if needed, but it would have to be cycled into those three categories, okay. the, the three broad categories. So it wasn't just allocated just to the radio system. It was on the list within the fire. Here, here's what it says. Yeah. Okay. Projects will be owned or operated by both the county projects. Trans number one, transportation, 51%. Number two, fire, EMS, and public radio system, 32%. And number three, parks and recreation, 17%. So if you had a savings on public radio system, it would we have to go into fire and EMS. To build and use it. Whatever's left, we could use it to help build the new fire station. Fire, EMS. Okay. All right, All right. I yield back. I okay. just wanted to be clear, clear on that. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Mitchell. Oh no, no, no. Oh, oh, no, I thought it was. I got one then. Okay. Now, now well, to that point, so, so, the city had a generic, a, a general framing of public safety. So, why didn't we? Well, based on map. Yeah. And it, it's not a. It's, it's okay. more of a. Okay. So why didn't we? So it looked like the 2009 SPLOS was all about the sheriff, and the 2016 SPLOS was all about the administration. So we're going to go back to the words in the middle of conversations that they had, like, okay, I see how y'all did that. Right? Follow the math. Highly concentrated in one, and highly concentrated in the other. The administration was well taken care of in this appropriation of money, and the Constitution Office got nothing. Right, so you follow, it, it's just sort of you step back and you look at, okay, look at, it just, it made no sense. Everybody should eat. It doesn't have to be equal, but it should be equitable. And for the sheriff, I mean, you sit here, we go into the question, like, it just makes no sense. This town said, this county, it, we, we, we pride ourselves on public safety. We pride ourselves on uh, keeping crime low, but yet we don't put nothing into it. Nothing. And two sploths. Nothing into the very thing that we say that we're about, but yet we sit there and we complain, like, okay, but well, where'd the money go? It got drained out to the, 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 the local, whatever you want to call it, of Douglas County, the elite, right? But you didn't accomplish the broader objective. I'm okay if you if you were accomplishing that, you had boots on the street, you gave them better horses, I'm, I'm with that. But in these two sponsors, the very thing that we talk about we're about, and then we want to cry that, oh, crime is going on, what have you done for two spots to even address that? And this is when it becomes real, we really, you're being honest about what we're looking at. And, and, we're, and the decisions that I'm sure we've got to face in the next couple of months, or 45 days, give or take, you know, it's just, it, it's sort of a constraint. It's not a handicap, but it's a constraint. And so it's about setting the public's expectation. And there's, there's some other things that we may have to do to sort of get forward with that. If there's a real pressure that, look, we would like to see something, like, okay, well, there's a couple of options. Hopefully we'll talk about it in our finance committee, like, okay, where I'm gonna get this money to, to replace this this fleet? How are we gonna do this? Because it's a very real Madam Chair, you can't do it on the back solely on the general fund. It, it, you're just not gonna be able to make up for that. And I'm looking at this like, man, you you guys left a lot on the table. It was very selfish, very like my own world, my own kingdom. It was it was nothing about the county. And I'm serious about this. Like, man, look at y'all decision making on this. You left us. Look where you left us at. And I feel for the people that are out there who are, who are the crying out, who feel disenfranchised from government decisions, but you guys don't care. You've got this elite group. And that, 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 that hurts because, like, man, come on, guys, we could have did better than this. But anyway, I'm going to believe it at night, Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh,
<laughs> Thank you so much, um, Ms. Cable. <clears throat> Great presentation. We're going to move on. It is almost the noon hour. We're almost there. It's about yep. noon. Yeah, it is the noon hour. So we have a few other items to push through. Yep. And uh, again, I'm just contemplating on our uh, committee updates. I know I've been pushing them back the last two meetings. I may have to move them again. This has been a relatively <laughs> robust <laughs> meeting. Okay, we're going to move, start with tab number 12, authorization to approve a one-year service contract with NCI Incorporation for the tax and tag annex for a total and, uh, annual cost of $7,697 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Worthington. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, as you said, this is an annual contract for NCI. This is a tax and tag administration building. Uh, NCI will come out quarterly, do firmware updates, software updates, uh, clean some of the equipment. It's also a contract so that if we have any kind of issue, they guarantee same day or with a service within 24 hours and a repair or replacement within 36 hours. So. Okay. Pretty stuff explanatory. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Director Worthington. Tab number 13, authorization for the fire department to uh, apply for and accept grant, fund, uh, grant funds from the Georgia Trauma Commission in the anticipated amount of $5,083.05 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Chief Stinson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we put in for this grant, uh, or attempt to put in for this grant every year. We've been very successful. Uh, the Georgia Trauma Commission has uh, been very favorable to taking care of uh, our ambulance service. Uh, uh, what we intend to purchase with this is called a bender lift. Uh, it allows us to put this device around the patient uh, so that people now have handles on them. We can pick them up by the handles instead of having to pick them up awkwardly. We'll put it that way. Uh, it, it's especially useful in uh, our aging population uh, because, you know, the the older you get, the thinner your skin gets. So uh, we're excited about that. So that's what this is for. Okay. Any questions from the board? Sounds good. Pretty self-explanatory again. So let's move to tab number 14, authorization to approve a memorandum of agreement of affiliation between Douglas County Fire and EMS and Lithia Springs High School for emergency medical um, technician course and authorize the chairman to sign all, ready, uh, all related documents pending final legal review. Chief Spencer again. Yes, ma'am. In our fire and EMS committee, uh, we have been charged with thinking outside the box on ways to fill some of the positions we have. Uh, so we have uh, formed a partnership with Lithia Springs High School. Uh, they will be will be using the high school to teach uh, the, the uh, candidates. Uh, the EMT will be providing some of the instructors. Uh, so it's, it's a great partnership between both of us, and uh, we just need the approval of the board to enter into it. Okay. Very good. Any questions from the board? All right, we'll move on to the next item, tab number um, 15, authorization to approve an agreement with Cobb County Fire and emergency services for EMS clinical rotations and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, yes, ma'am. Chief Spencer. We currently have a mutual aid agreement with Cobb County. Uh, we utilize uh, their services and they utilize ours. Uh, what this agreement does is allow uh, some of the Cobb County firefighters who are currently in the EMT class to come over and third ride with us. So uh, uh, this is a clinical agreement just like we have with West Central Tech, uh, Chattahoochee Tech. Uh, they don't have ambulances in the fire department at COP, uh, but since we do, they want to see how we operate. And, uh, I think it will be beneficial for both both services. Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to tab number 16, authorization to approve a mem memorandum of understanding, MOU, the GEMA, to access, uh, to assess the grants uh, portal and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents, director of the whole. Yes, um, GEMA's moving to a more of an online format on the grants. When we do updates, you know, anytime you get a grant, you have to do quarterly updates. Mm -hmm. And they want us to start doing that. Um, instead of sending me sending paperwork on some of the grants, they want to, to have access to the grants portal. And um, so for us to, in order for us to continue to get Homeland Security and GEMA grants, we have to do this or they'll cut us off. So 
Okay, that's good. We're moving into the 21st century. Yes. So it's going to access. Any questions from the board? Yes, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I mean, uh, accountability is important. And, and that's something that we recognize that while we've been applying for federal grants for some, quite some time, and I know we've been reporting, um, some of our localized grants were not as effective. And so at some point, I'd like to see the administration move to a more standardized approach. Maybe we can approach this within our um, procurement, both on the, the front side of applying for grants and RFQs and all that, but as, as well as on the back side of reporting. So that's just more of an FYI hint, hint. But, um, I'm, I'm assuming that there is a standard, right? And, and yeah, um, they, you have to meet, um, when you accept a, when the GMO or Homeland Security grants, they have benchmarks that you they want you to meet at a certain time period. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll send you an email, it's time for you to do your update. We report to them where we are on that project. Yeah. And then, and sometimes you get behind or you haven't met so much, as long as you have a reason they're good with it. Yeah. They just want to know, they want you to not get a, um, not finish a project before the grant funding ends. If you don't use all of the money, on certain grants by the end of a grant period, yep. you lose it, and then the project's not finished, and that's bad. So we, we, we've never done that, so we try to keep, you know, we, we keep up with um, our benchmarks and keep up when the, there's an the issue, we let them know about it, and they're, they're always good either way. So, so, so both for, for money, as well as time, as well as scope, you've got to keep up with all that? Yes, how much time has been, uh, like on our, our current um, grant that we're working on with our Hazard mitigation update, we yep. keep up with a um, time period because that's, we can use that as in kind. It, it, it cuts down our cost. Yep. So, it, so all that track is important and we have to report that at, on a quarterly basis. Yeah, and I know sometimes people don't like the fact that we've got to be accountable and report while well, some people try to avoid federal grants, but it is what it is. I mean, you're using taxpayer money, you should be able to report uh, yes. accordingly. And, and they, they give you a structure to your point, this benchmark. I mean, this thing is it, it's proven. Um, I'm just looking forward to us adopting higher standards, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tab number 17, authorization to advertise for a public hearing to consider amendments to the Douglas County Code of Ordinances regarding section 6-350 of Article uh, 22, Property Maintenance Code, and section 11-71, definitions of Article 5, um, noise control. Uh, Philip Schaeffer, how are you doing? Madam Chair, Board. These are a couple of little amendments that I came across when we were researching some of the code of ordinances versus our normal UDC. They refer, uh, first I was asked by the building department to change the property maintenance code so it would be a more generic reference to the version of the adopted statutes that they would then be applying as the rules. So that's what that's about. Um, not a year specific reference, but a generic reference to what gets approved statutorily so that they had something they could work with and maintain continuity and also maintain the, the current version of what their rules actually apply for. So that's the property maintenance one. The noise ordinance, um, it was a reference to the old zoning ordinance. So in our code of ordinances, we refer back and forth between the old zoning ordinance and the code of ordinances. This was simply the noise ordinance itself was referring to three categories, broad categories, uh, residential, industrial, and commercial properties as a generic title for what the noise ordinance would apply to, but it also referred to the old M1 and R1, the old zoning districts were what it was referring to as generically encompassed by these broader categories. So we wanted to bring those two things up to date so one refers to the current UDC and its actual zone districts. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, so what, what is the ask? Is it a public hearing? Is this just we're going to approve it? It's, what, a, public what, it's a public hearing, right? To advertise for the public yeah. hearing to adopt the, uh, these small changes to the code of ordinances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so as you find these small, again, we're, we're sensitive to just the time. Are you doing this in batch, or can we expect that as you go through this process, we're going to find these nickels and dimes and pennies, or are we going to come with one? I mean, so far, we've been finding lots of pennies, okay. and eventually, we'll probably find some quarters. What we'd like to do is, as Ron's already brought to you, the overall code, the UDC is going to be uh, evaluated. Right. I just I keep finding these because we were looking back as the references from the UDC to the code of ordinances and from the code of ordinances back to the UDC. So when those were separated out, um, you needed a, a finer tooth comb to go through the old code of ordinances to just catch some of these old references. 
There's probably still a dozen left that we that I could bring to you that are very easy. They're extremely ex extremely simple. But it's just rather than referring the code of ordinances to this old zoning ordinance, mm -hmm. we should be referring to the uniform unified development code. All right. Just Good. the title, that kind of thing. No, I appreciate it. Just for use of time, again, if these are administrative and they're small, why wouldn't we just batch them together? You're making us have a public hearing for the public to hear something that sounds like it's simple, right? So we don't want to have six and seven and eight public hearings and spending that expense to, 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 to notify the public to come out on something that's, that, that's administrative, mm -hmm. that, that seems real. So I'd, I'd like the administration to consider, I'm sure, Ron, you guys need to think about how y'all approach this. Because again, if it's big and it's meeting, we need the public's participation, great. But we don't want to like, hey, come on out. I mean, we, we got to be sensitive when we when we summon the public. Uh, that, that it's got to be worth it while. And so to your point, because it's small and, and mundane as you say it is, then let's batch it all together to make it worth the time, the effort, and the money. Yeah. That can easily be done. Oh, you have a question? You said it can be. It can easily be done. It, yeah. Okay. The others, the others can. I, oh, I can others aggregate them all. This is just the first two I found. Okay. Great catch. Uh, we definitely need to make sure that our uh, unified <coughs> development code is where it should be in terms of uh, up to date. So thank you. All right. Last but not least, tab number eighteen, authorization to approve a four-year. SunTrust Master Lease Agreement to control cars, equipment refresh, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Major Holmes. I think Kenny said he would like oh, okay. to speak on this one. Uh, Major Holmes and I talk, and we're going to let this go through tomorrow. Madam Chair, there's going to be a few adjustments from the language in it. We've sent changes over to SunTrust. They've sent something back. I see a few minor revisions coming from that. But I told uh, Major Holmes that I didn't want to hold up the sheriff's office, so we're going to go ahead and process this tomorrow, knowing there'll be a few minor changes. Just so you know, when you're doing a finance like this over a period of time, there's some strict compliance under Georgia law okay. that the, their master lease didn't quite meet. It was more of an omnibus bank loan type lease, and we had to change that so it fit Georgia law for governments. But we're close enough now, I think we can go ahead and get it approved. We'll hold off on signature until we get the final language and hopefully that will be done this week. Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have come in. Yeah, just, and, and again, back to this master lease. And, it, and it's, like you said, read that first sentence again. Sheriff cars. Sheriff patrol cars, equipment, refresh. All right, so that, so that's real important. It's in the, the cars, it's how, I understand. It. Yeah, it's how it was said. Sheriff cars, equipment, not sheriff patrol cars, right? It's the equipment that goes in the cars, not the cars. Or are we talking about cars? We're talking about the equipment that goes in the cars. All right, let's be clear that, 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 that we don't authorize this. The next thing I know, we've got, if that was the intent to do a lease for the cars, Let's do that, but it, but what I don't want it to be is a sleight of hand or an unintended sleight of hand that we're only talking about the equipment that goes in the car. So can we just make sure? That's Bobby, it? is that what you understand? It is. It's, it's just a refresh for all the computers and computer accessories for the patrol cars. Nothing else. Computers, and computer accessories, and even that can't be touched by the spots. It's communication equipment. You can log on to the internet. You can log on and talk to the the, the, the communication tower. I can't. It's not on the car. I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay, I won't belabor it. I'm trying, really. All right, I yield, Madam Chair. Okay, and I believe that uh, lease agreement just really helps you to stay uh, current because, you know, technology just keeps changing, right? So lease yes. is probably the best way to go in this. And we appreciate your attempt, uh, Commissioner, to try and get us the car. We yeah. yeah. no, you say you try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working it today. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else, I will certainly um, yield to... Uh, Attorney and um, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into the executive section? Yeah, yes, ma'am, we need to do it for uh, litigation and personnel. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion to be second. Uh, any discussion? Oh, but do they have the reports from No, I just said I'm going to defer the reports today. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm gonna, let me just announce, I'm deferring the reports again. We'll be here all day. We have other meetings, and I'm going to try to see what I can do to place it on our next meeting. So I know you probably had dress rehearsal, and you're ready to go, and I'm so sorry about that, but it's, uh, it's 12, almost 1220. So are y'all okay with that? Just, uh, just we'll have it on our next. I'll see if Lisa rolling in the next um, meeting, and 
we'll try to limit our presentations, okay? All right, with that being said, we have a motion on the second for executive session. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. I said aye. 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 Okay, we have a five on the unanimous vote, and the motion carries. So take 10 minutes and come back. Mm -hmm. Sweet spot. All right, Board of Commissioners, we are back into session. If any other discussions, we've had a great meeting today. Very productive. Any other questions or concerns before I adjourn? If there's no questions, uh, any other thing to come before this body, this meeting is adjourned.